Let's try this. There we go. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you with us today. Um, today is, of course, World Communion Sunday, if you haven't figured it out yet. Um, as part of our regular communion services, um, we do offer a, another basket where we collect a spare change, whatever people want to contribute, towards the congregation's benevolent fund which is an account that we can draw on when people in desperate need come to us. We've got policies around how we distribute that, those funds, but we do try to keep an account so that uh, if someone in uh, emergency need does a protest, we do have some resources to offer. So we are receiving donations to that today, as well as our regular offering. Um, wanted to make sure I mentioned that before I forgot. I see Tom's going around making sure everyone has their communion elements. Wonderful. So and thank you and welcome to everyone and also to those who are joining us online. A, a heartfelt welcome to all of you. No. Oh, okay, I'm on. All right. I'd just like to remind everyone next, thank next Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday, and we'll have some baskets out here if you'd like to bring some non-perishable items to give to the food bank. Uh, and also to remind you that uh, we're still looking for donations to our food grains project, and we will have that open until the end of October, and then uh, I'll be remitting that. So if you still like to donate to our food grains um, please do so sometime during October. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to find the words because somebody, somebody posted. Ellie, can you flip back to the slide that has the mice event on it for me, please? So um, I, I'm sure you've seen around town the paddles that Gina McKinty, Wilson McKinty, and her group have been doing for water. And um, to mesh with that, Don and I are involved with a group, <clears throat> and it's MICE, it's Memory Inclusive Communities Everywhere. So it's for people, um, the, the idea is to get out there to show that if you are, um, if you do have an acquired brain change, which is another way of saying dementia, and it's a far nicer way to say dementia, um, that, that there are things that communities can do to make it more engaging, more welcoming, um, and easier to get around. And, and it's the weirdest, funniest little things sometimes make it difficult for people with, with an acquired brain change. I mean, a threshold, a doorway can be difficult, um, speaking from experience. Anyway, um, uh, so mice is has a project, and the project is Create with Mice. And the first one was held a couple weeks ago over at Edgewater, and it was po um, pottery. And that went really well. Um, the targeted audience is really people who are experiencing or living with people with acquired brain changes. So the next one, I think the next one, is the paddles. And. Uh, as if you've seen the advertisements for creating these paddles, I mean, it's not cheap. But we have a grant, and this is uh, open to 20 people. You phone the number that's on the poster. There's a poster down by the entranceway um, to meet Gina, to learn. And I think Gina's been here presenting as well. Um, so, so this is an event that's coming up that's near and dear to our hearts. And if anyone's interested, I just wanted to let you know. The other thing... It doesn't take much to make me happy. Um, so Joyce and Joanne Myron and I have been busy 
writing grant proposals. And uh, we've been writing one huge one, which on honestly, it, like it wants everything, including the name of our firstborn and our blood type. You know, it's just crazy how much information you need. So we have been working every Monday for a couple hours the last month or so to get this out. So we wrote, we have several groups we're applying to for grants, and this is for the kitchen, because as you know, our kitchen is aging and requires some significant safety upgrades. So uh, we got a grant. It's just like, ooh. <laughs> now, <clears throat> will it pay for the whole project? No. <laughs> but it's $1,000 more than we had yesterday. So, and this is how the Niagara Extension Council, God bless them, um, we have uh, benefited from their grants in the past. Um, it's called a mission grant, and so we do have a grant of $1,000 to, uh, you know, sort of start the bucket, filling the bucket, and we will hopefully be able to report some more success in the weeks to come. But this is going to hopefully get us down that path to uh, renovating and upgrading the kitchen so that we once again, again can use it safely. And uh, as it is, you know, it's the heart. I always say it's the heart of the... This might be the soul of the church, but the kitchen's our heart, right? <laughs> or our stomach. Anyway, thank you. Good morning. Next Tuesday, our worship committee is meeting at 6.30, but at 5.30, we're going to be here decorating the sanctuary for Thanksgiving. So if anyone has anything they'd like to um, add to our collection of Thanksgiving things, bring them over Tuesday and leave them in the office or just put them up here and we'll make sure to have it ready for next Sunday. Before we get started, I want to just acknowledge that much of today's worship service I, I took from the Presbyterian Church USA, um, their World Communion service. And so you, and they're making use of prayers and responses and things like that that come from a whole lot of different people from all around the world and different Christian traditions. And I think that it's, it indicates who they are as you go through. So you'll see who wrote the various prayers and things like that as we go. And it also includes a lot of uh, language from different languages, words. I'm gonna say everything in English. I'll be careful about that because I don't want to offend anyone by mispronouncing terribly some of the things that are there. So, but I just wanted to acknowledge where this comes from. Okay, uh, is there anything else? We have a video provided by the moderator of the United Church, uh, the right Reverend Carmen Lansdowne, um, because yesterday, well, Friday was Orange Shirt Day, yesterday was Truth and Reconciliation Day. Did I get those dates right, Ellie? Excellent. So anyways, so Carmen Lansdowne has a message that uh, we wanted to share. So it's about a four minute video. Greetings. I'm the Right Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne, moderator of the United Church of Canada. Saturday, September 30th, we observe the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, 
we witness and honor the healing journey of survivors and families of the residential school experience, and we remember those who didn't make it home. Phyllis Webstad, founder and ambassador of Orange Shirt Day, is a residential school survivor and community leader who continues to raise awareness of Every Child Matters by sharing stories of the individual, family, and community intergenerational impacts of the residential school experience. Orange Shirt Day is not to be celebrated as a holiday. It is a day to reflect, to learn, and to pray about the continued impact of colonial policies and governance in what we now call Canada. Whether you attended one of the schools, whether you're an intergenerationally affected relative like me, a granddaughter of a survivor, whether you're a parent left behind or a non-Indigenous person in Canada who has fed a false history, Orange Shirt Day means every child matters. Indian residential schools operated in Canada between the 1870s and the 1990s. The last Indian residential school closed in 1996. Between 1925 and 1969, the United Church of Canada operated a total of 15 institutions within the Indian Act system as a part of the federal government's policy of assimilating Indigenous peoples. The Heltzik Joint Leadership of Hereditary Chiefs and elected chief and counselors have called not for reconciliation, but for a concept in our language called Hilsistut, or to turn around and make things right. It is not about reconciling two parties who have harmed each other, but non-Indigenous accountability for harms done to Indigenous people in the name of the church, in the name of the crown, and as a society that has normalized Euro-Christian whiteness. As members of a church that operated residential institutions, every member of the United Church of Canada is accountable for learning about the tragic and painful legacy of the institutions and how it continues to impact the lives of Indigenous peoples across the country. Children in those institutions suffered physical, sexual, emotional, spiritual, and cultural abuse. This resulted in the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement which included the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Its final report and calls to action make clear that there is still a very long journey ahead of us as we seek to make things right. Racist or colonial policies continue to harm Indigenous children and their families. They manifest in inequitable funding for education and injustices are perpetrated under the Indigenous Child Welfare Act. On September 30th, and every day, we must remember that every child matters. One way we can be proactive in showing Indigenous young people that they matter is by investing in the Wase Abin program. This program awards annual scholarships for post-secondary education to Indigenous students ages 18 to 29 who demonstrate financial need and academic excellence. I hope you will join me with millions of other Canadians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike, and spend time in reflection, prayer, and action on this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Wallace Gaeska, Every Child Matters. gather from the west 
Is that better? Yep. We gather from the west to the east, from the south to the north, to celebrate the God of peace, who accompanies us in our acts of peace. This God of peace accompanies us in each and every circumstance around us. We praise God's name. Amen. And let us pray. And, uh, I'm just curious if it's got... No, it, this prayer comes from Reverend, Reverend Lydia Nashangwe of Zimbabwe. Our God who is, our Creator God, our Heavenly Father, bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships. Bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of people. Bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war. Bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Now let us join together in singing our opening hymn, Open My Eyes, number 371 in Voices United. Thank you. The call to confession this morning comes from well, I'm not sure exactly the Near East School of Theology student uh, named Armen Shant Agushian, who's Armenian. It's from the Union of Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East. Faced with God's goodness, we recognize our failings. In the knowledge of God's mercy, we dare tell the truth about ourselves and our world. In the confidence of God's children, let us confess our sins. And this prayer is written by Jamil Mayer Kadir, again of the Near East School of Theology, the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Holy Land. It was originally written in Arabic. 
Gracious Lord, creator of this universe, in your generosity you have given us a world of abundance and diversity. Yet we lived guided by greed and selfishness. We confess that we have defaced your creation and poisoned our environment through our consumerist behavior and for personal gain. In Christ you made us brothers and sisters and intended for us to be united, and yet we have built walls to separate us from those who are different from us. You gave us wisdom and creativity, and we have used those to trick each other and to develop weapons of destruction and death. You gave us laws to order our lives, and we have abused them to take revenge and punish our enemies. We love war rather than strive for peace. We ignore the poor and the weak and honor the rich and powerful. In all this we have not lived according to your will. Forgive us, Lord, for daring to boast in our human achievements and for failing to recognize that you alone are worthy of praise. In your mercy, forgive, our, forgive us our sins. And again from Shantagushian, words of affirmation. I'm making use of Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, and Ephesians, chapter 2. God accepted us simply because of our faith in Christ, through whom our sins were forgiven. May he help us to continue to preach peace to those who are near and far. Amen. And uh, Kirby, I invite you forward. Thank you. Sometimes I still try to take control Cause I can't see the end that ever be And all you want from me is to let go Stay. 
Thank you, Kirby. And uh, I believe Jane is reading our scripture this morning. Scriptures. Good morning. Gail's a little under the weather this morning, so she recruited me. Our first reading is from Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and encamped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and ye shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is this a Lord among us or not? And the second reading is from Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man has two sons, he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kirby. May these words be blessed to our understanding. I sometimes suspect that it can't be emphasized enough, what I'm about to say. When you look at Hebrew scripture, when you look at the Gospels, you are treated to a constant stream of people conversing, debating, arguing, questioning, doubting, whether it is with one another or with God. Just keep finding these stories where there are people questioning what's going on, debating one another, arguments going on back and forth, 
quarreling, so it seems. The history of the people of Israel, the Jewish nation, is one of struggling with God and at the same time with one another. I bring that up to attempt to set the scene for today's two scripture readings. Moses is leading the people of Israel out of slavery and slowly, oh so slowly, toward the promised land. Last week's scripture reading, they were grumbling over a lack of food. Now it's a lack of water. They have quickly reverted to type and are wondering if the road back to Egypt is easier and more comfortable than to keep moving forward. They are once, quest- once again questioning if God is with them and helping them. Where's the evidence? And voila, here comes the evidence. Guess what? God never once left their sides. And better news yet, even in the midst of their grumbling and their questioning, God did not abandon them. No, God certainly does not make things easy for them. Fear and uncertainty and discomfort are not banished. But the water they require is provided. Meanwhile, in Matthew, we are treated to this example, and I've lost count of Jesus being questioned or debated by the priests and the leaders of the temple. The religious leaders of his day are asking questions yet again of Jesus. And again, I am far from convinced this is an attempt by leaders to put Jesus in his place. This is challenging Jesus, as most teachers of religion and scripture in that day would be challenged. What is the extent of his learning, his imagination, his ability to answer a question? This is the nature of the Jewish religion. Ask questions, discuss, debate, pose extra questions. Let your imagination run with the story we've been told. Where does it lead you? What does that tell you? What does that teach you? That's all part of this, this, their tradition. By what authority do you teach? If you take time to consider the question, it really doesn't seem that out of place, quite frankly. If we remove the idea that they are asking this of Jesus, our Jesus, if you take that out of the equation and consider our response if we walked into the church to find someone we had yet to vet teaching our children, teaching people, our friends and neighbors, we might, maybe we should, ask the same question. By what authority are you here doing this? As is his habit, Jesus answers with his own questions. Do you trust the prophet John the baptizer? He then offers a challenge about the nature of faith. And this is where he gets gets quite pointed in his questioning, arguing that as much as these officials will publicly acknowledge the authority of John, they don't really act on it. He adds that it is well and good to say the words, to declare your faith, But things need to go beyond words and proclamations. How you actually live, what you actually do in the name of that faith, is important, perhaps more important. We struggle with that one, don't we? There is a lot of time spent on the idea of belief, of declaring, I believe or I have faith. And I don't mean to or want to disparage that, those declarations, not for a minute. But Jesus asks the question, if one person says no to a direction, but then later fulfills the request, and another says yes, but then doesn't follow through, who is actually doing the will? The one doing the asking. And I want to be clear here. I don't think Jesus is making an argument in favor of obedience to God. 
or at least not as we may see that word now. As I noted earlier, the, quest, the history and the writings of Jewish scripture don't exactly paint the picture of a people of blind obedience and subservience. Jesus is getting at a, a larger point, I believe. One that his brother James is pretty direct in addressing in his letter, found in the epistles of the New Testament. From James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and you, yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself if it has no works, is dead. It's not enough to say you have faith. If your faith does not move you to do something, what's the point? The goal, the vision that God offers us is a world of love and compassion, a world of justice and peace, Our faith tells us this is possible, and it also moves us to work with God to make it a reality. Today is World Communion Sunday. People from around the world, from a host of different denominations, people who declare faith in Jesus the Christ and act it out in a great many different ways, in different languages, different songs and forms of worship, who see God at work in the world in more ways than we can begin to count. They are all today participating in the celebration of communion. This act of sharing bread and juice or wine from the vine or whatever they have that they can use to to participate in this holy feast. We all declare that we are part of the body of Christ. We all feed on Christ's love and Christ's love made real and tangible. We are all connected and drawn together in and through Jesus the Christ. And we may call it a commandment when Jesus tells us to love one another just as we are loved. But do we need for that to be a commandment? that we are compelled to obey? Or does the simple reality that when we take time to recognize that Christ draws us together, connects us as part of a vine that runs through creation, provide us with a greater awareness of how we are all part of that same body? That to ignore, to neglect, to harm one part of that vine brings harm to it all. Jesus challenges us. He challenges us to think, to think about the world in which we live. And he challenges us to open our eyes to new possibilities and to new ways of experiencing the world around us, to listen to what is said to us and around us, and to reflect on what kind of world we have and what we want. And finally, Jesus challenges us to act out our faith and to act for the world God desires for us and tells us is possible and just in front of us. And also that we are not alone in our vision and in our desire and in our work. For that we can say thanks be to God. Amen. I'm inviting you guys to sing now in our and our music after the sermon. So we join, stand as you are able and join in singing My Love Colors Outside the Lines. Number 138 in more voices.
Thank you. As we come to present our offerings at this table, we remember God's generous, generous hospitality. Our calling is to feed those dismissed from the world's tables, that they may no longer feel hungry or alone. And so as we gather our offering together and present it, let us join in singing our offertory hymn for the gift of creation. Let us pray. Loving and generous God, all that we have, all that we are, all that we produce comes from you. Please accept what we offer back now and bless it that it may do your will and your work and empower us to do your will and your work as we move forward from here. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Make sure I'm not forgetting something. We have a hymn before communion. We just get, get to keep singing today. So I invite you to please join in the song, singing of As We Gather at Your Table. I prepare things.
Amen. Please be seated. On this World Communion Day, as you can see, we've set the table with breads representing a lot of different places and traditions and cultures. Not all by any stretch of the imagination. I don't want to uh, get ahead of myself, but we do have breads from different places, um, flat breads and rye and pumpernickel and bannock. So I want to acknowledge that. And uh, I also want to, as I do every time, make this invitation that regardless of who you are, where you come from, where you are on your journey, you are invited and you are welcome at this table regardless of whether you are a member of this congregation or not, whether you are a member, a member of this denomination or not. Jesus welcomes all. Jesus is eager to sit down and dine with all. And so this table has room for all. It sometimes may seem that we're running out of chairs. Christ makes room for more. You are all welcome here. As usual, as we get to the end of our communion prayer, you will be invited to join me in consuming a piece of bread. And then a little bit later on, after the pouring of the cup, you will be invited to join me in eating a grape which represents our juice, the fruit of the vine. <coughs> and so we pray. This is the table to which Jesus invites us. Let us participate joyfully. God planted seeds now germinate, a tree of life, an orchard bearing fruit, such is nature, abundant life budding. And Jesus sets the table invites us to dine. Water into wine, land where bread is born, a people on the path of perfect, of perfect communion. The Holy One is here. Your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. It is indeed good and right to give you thanks and praise, O God of many names. You made a covenant with Noah and caused nations in their amazing diversity to spread over the face of the earth. As of old, you led your people out of a land of enslavement to a land of promise. So too you led our ancestors and some among us into new lands of possibility, there to find you anew. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus in every aspect, human as we are. He grew up in a small town in Galilee, far from the seat of religious and civil power. He spoke with a distinct accent. He learned the, of the breadth of your grace from a Gentile mother. Beside Jacob's well, he was moved by an encounter with a minority woman and disclosed his messianic identity. Therefore, with these and other ancestors in the faith, both named and unnamed, who through the ages and all over the world have borne courageous witness to the hope within them, we praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy God, power of life and love, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna through the ages. Blessed is the one who comes to bring your justice to earth. On the last night he spent with his friends, Jesus took an age-old tradition of his people and transformed it into something new. He took bread, staple food of his land, blessed it and broke it and gave it to those around him saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine, common drink of his people, and gave it to them, saying, 
drink this, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you do this, remember me. By remembering Jesus in this way now, we claim our common heritage as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send, O covenant God, your Holy Spirit upon us and what we do here that we and these gifts empowered by your Spirit may become signs of shalom to one another and to all peoples of the earth through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours everywhere, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we also remember all those with whom you would have us share your feast. We pray for all who are in sorrow or in pain. All who are ill or alone. All who live with fear, oppression, or hunger. All who the world counts as last and least. We pray for your church and its varied ministries. For the nations as they strive for peace and justice. For the earth and the fragile web of life we share. And for our families and our friends. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to our mother who loves us. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks for this bread, fruit of the earth and hard work, a gift of the grace of God. We break it and share it, remembering the words and actions, gestures and glances, silences and self-offered life of the teacher from Nazareth. Jesus Christ, the body of love. We give thanks for the fruit of the vine, for the joy of communion, for alliances that endure in the search for justice and wholeness. We take the cup, knowing we are part of a community people, renewing its covenant with life. Jesus Christ, the cup of the new covenant. to see if everyone stopped chewing before I ask you to join me in prayer. <laughs> Let us join our voices together, our hearts together in prayer after communion. 
Oh, well then I guess I'll say it myself. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you that you have called your people from east and west and north and south to feast at the table of Jesus Christ. Keep us faithful to your will. Go with us to the streets, to our homes, and to our places of labor and leisure, that whether we are gathered or scattered, we may be the servant church of the servant Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us join in singing now. It's a song of praise to the maker. It's number 30 and more voices. Okay, um, that's on? All right. I thank you for joining with me today in this time of worship, this time of communion and prayer, and reflection and celebration. And as we go forth, I offer you this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now and forevermore. Amen.